Cause like a winter From wherever you are around the world, welcome and thank you for joining us in today's special edition, Kelly's Causes. That's right, my co-host today is Kelly Carlson. She's a former Nip Tuck star and also works with the Center for Security Policy. Let's welcome to the circle, Kelly Carlson. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you for joining me. <laughs> of course. And our guest today, who's going to be an FBI agent who specializes in threat assessment. Her name is Dr. Kathleen Puckett. She spent 23 years as an FBI special agent. She is currently a behavior analyst and co-founder of TK Associates LLC in San Francisco. Let's welcome Dr. Puckett to the show. How are you, Dr. Puckett? I'm very well. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for being here. This is a topic. We're going to have two parts of this show first part, we're going to talk about threat assessment and risk analysis, which is really dear to the heart of Kelly, mm -hmm. who unfortunately had experienced something very similar to it. Not a very good, pleasant experience. We'll hear a little bit more about that in a little bit. But Dr. Puckett is also going to talk to us in part two about lone domestic terrorists, as well as other types of terrorists. And we're going to get her insight and opinion about what happened in France, that mm -hmm. tragedy. So first off, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what threat assessment is and risk analysis. I'm assuming there's only one kind of threat assessment. Oh no, there's all kinds of different kinds of threat assessment. Um, in industry, for example, they do all kinds of technical threat assessment. Um, and uh, part of security analysis has to do with all kinds of different levels of assessment, electronic, uh, te all technical things. My specific uh, use of it is, and I in the FBI and since I retired, is to uh, when people come to me, and they're usually individuals who are represented by attorneys or corporations who are represented by attorneys, usually law firms contract with our company, and they want to know what they're dealing with. They come to us when they don't know what else to do because they think they're under threat, but they can't define it. They don't know who in some instances it is, or what is exactly the threat is. And that's what we do. We essentially analyze what is happening and what whether the threat is a greater level of threat or a lesser level of threat, and then what to do about that for, you know, as far as measures to take to mitigate the threat, eliminate it, or if it's going to go to a law enforcement level uh, to do it that way. Sometimes we end up doing interviews of people which resolve, which do some interesting resolutions happen as a result of that. So um, essentially, risk analysis is just how vulnerable your company is at, or your, you are in general. Mm -hmm. You know, risk analysis is what's your daily risk walking out the door? Uh, what's your risk at your company? Threat assessment has to do with a specific instance that comes up that it is threatening to an individual or a corporation mm -hmm. or a group. Now, on your, you said there were different levels. How would you determine what levels? That is the interesting, that's the art of it. It's not a science. Mm -hmm. The art of threat assessment is the way I practice it, the way I developed it in the FBI, uh, was kind of under the foreign counterintelligence uh, side of the house in the FBI, where we were working against spies. So they're very sophisticated, and you have to get to know as much as you can about a very elusive subject who, who, may, who you may be confronted with. So essentially what I do, the way I do it is I sift through an amazing amount of information, anything I can get from the investigators who are bringing this to me and say, I need to know um, where this person lives. I need a photo of the house. I need, a, I need to know what cars he or she drives. I need to know the restaurants they go to. I need to, I, I need to know very, very bedrock things. And then I need to know what books they they read? What what if they can give me any information at all? Uh, it, it it is incorporated into my analysis because since I have a PhD in clinical psychology, I'm able to integrate sure. what those might mean as to what risk they're posing. For example, I'll give you a very very quick example. I love examples. Um, mm -hmm. An example would be uh, a veteran 
who was suffering from AIDS became wildly violent. He was being treated at a veterans hospital and threatened the head of the hospital with death and was going to all kinds of means to, he, they just thought he went crazy. He had a whole treatment team. Essentially what my partner and I did was look at everything that was happening with this guy and what we figured out was he wasn't real he was doing what he thought he needed to do to get the attention of the VA and not to give up on him because he didn't want to die they had him in a in a uh, experimental program in San Francisco after a while there was nothing they could do for him so they said you know what why don't you stay in the East Bay and be seen by these nice people at this other place he didn't want the nice people he didn't want the other place he wanted to live he didn't want to die so his treatment team was unaware of what this essential dynamic was that was driving him. When they learned about it, all they had to do was reinstate his status as part of it. Look, we understand your fears. He completely calmed down. He was not a psychiatric subject after all, wow. except, you know, in the case that everyone's a psychiatric suspect. But we right. told them about their guy, and they had been treating this guy for years. So all of a sudden this comes up, you're getting the head of this office, you know, this is a big deal. It's like a, a you know, very major executive. Now what usually happens is all of a sudden they start hiring a lot of security or, you know, you think it's the best thing to do is, is surround yourself with an outer layer of security. And in some cases, like, like Kelly's, it's, it's necessary and appropriate. In this case, all that was necessary to know was what the guy's story really was. And that's what behavioral analysis is. Mm -hmm. It essentially tells you what's going on in that, per as far as we can tell, what's going on with that person now. Right. And what are they, based on what they've done before and what they've been like before, are they more or less likely, based on what everything we know, to act in a violent way or to be mitigated somehow? Now, I know we talked off camera. You were telling me that... It's no longer termed criminal profiling? No, profiling has gotten a really bad rap since uh, it got associated with the word racial profiling. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have anything to do with racial issues. Uh, and in fact, profiling, the term profiling, isn't used in law enforcement and intelligence work anymore. Uh, it's behavioral analysis is the term now, which is, is doesn't, there's no formula for human behavior. Right. And there's no template for what's appropriate or what isn't. Everything is situational. And so behavioral analysis takes into account what's going on with an individual or a group of individuals in a certain situation responsive to a certain stimulus. Mm -hmm. So you're presenting to the people who feel threatened or are threatened or something is happening. You're presenting a lens to look at these people, what's happening and, and understand the person may be mentally ill and unable to control their behavior. In that case, there are other things that can be done. The person may be uh, uh, concerned about something that nobody knows anything about, like this guy that I just described to you. So people assume, we all assume that everybody thinks like we do mm -hmm. and everybody's the same. And gee, I wouldn't say that. Or why would I, why would I, attorneys are great about this. Attorneys will say to me, why would anybody in their right mind do that? And I say, well, <laughs> I heard that too. Perhaps that's why you're talking to me. If they're not in your right mind, maybe they're not going to think like you. I just don't understand that that way of thinking. Attorneys are very rationally oriented, and um, and most people are pretty rationally oriented, emotionally too. But um, but basically, we all expect people to be reasonable, and when they're not, you know, it's the interpretation of that behavior is what I do. Yeah, we still try to put them in that box, even though they're acting irrational. We keep trying to force them to be rational. It just doesn't mm -hmm. work. Right. That's what my wife tells me. So, <laughs> Kelly, um, you had some good questions about you wanted to ask Dr. Puckett. Yeah. Um, when you are, are doing an analysis on an individual, would it be fair to say there may be indicators that you can communicate to your client um, as a way to possibly give them insight into this person's behavior or maybe intent with this person? Um, maybe patterns or personality traits? I know it's not a science, it's not definitive, but do you ever say to your client, well, based on 
what I've witnessed and understood about this person, here is what could be possible. Um, take it into consideration. Right. That's all. You're describing exactly what we do. Kim. Okay. Here's 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 a good example. Um, sometimes you don't know who's doing it. Right. Sometimes you get. I deal with a lot of threatening letters, anonymous mm. threatening letters to people, prominent people, uh, celebrities, or you know, corporations or whatever, threatening uh, sabotage of, of company assets, sure. threatening uh, physical violence or, or uh, ruination, you know, of reputations and things like that. Basically what I do when I get in, um, in, and it's a, it's a questionable, uh, it's, a, it's an equivocal communication where you, you just don't know, you don't, you don't know where it came from. So this is where being an investigator helps with doing the behavioral analysis because essentially you're going to get all kinds of help like what you know what kind of uh what terms are used here what's the statement analysis here um what level of education is this person uh does this person show familiarity with the with the victims uh uh what do they know about the victim and you can try to start placing i can usually figure out mm -hmm. who sent the letter eventually sure uh, because they have an agenda, right? You know, and they want they keep recontacting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that is what I do is not something that most people could do because uh, if you get a letter mm -hmm. that threatens you, the first thing you're going to do is react in a this this is bad for me. You're not going to be able to think about it rationally and logically. You need to hand it over to somebody who has no skin in the game as they say you know you just have to have somebody to, to say mm -hmm. look let us look at this for you you know you can you can you know be in our hands and if you uh, we'll try to make sense of this for you and then we'll go forward from there depending on what we find out or what we suspect usually it ends up to be someone in their life who they've had a conflict with or someone at the workplace who has a, a grudge or something like that. And we've, we're working a case right now, we're still in the process of working a case where um, a series of very, very uh, annoying uh, incidents turned out to be actual, actually a series of assaults on an employee's uh, life. Just, you know, getting mariachi bands to come to the office, getting, uh, you know, ordering food, getting, but, but every day. Every for day. Provoking. Yeah, for six months. Yeah. And, you know, the, what's the criminal offense? Oh. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're right. going to have to go in <sighs> in a different kind of, right. of, you know, you're not getting anybody who's, th it's, it's an annoyance, but it's not going to a felony level. And I have a question. So would you, looking at that, would you assume that the perpetrator is intelligent because he's not doing anything that's necessarily breaking the law, technically, but he knows that, he's getting... In that case, I thought... He's skirting legality here. Yeah. He's, he's not doing something that's going to get him thrown in jail. Uh, he thinks. He's not impulsive. But the problem is that when you start doing that, you lose track and you get over mm -hmm. overzealous. Okay. And uh, he started using the U.S. mails. Well, using sure. the U.S. mails to threaten or intimidate is a crime. It's a federal mm -hmm. crime. So now he's in Dutch. Got it. <laughs> so good. It's, right. it's, not, it's not good for him. That, but because the, the thing is that these people are not... These aren't rational acts. When people get emotional like this and they act emotionally, these aren't rational. So um, what you're trying to do is interpret irrational acts for, for their victims. I you know, like, what do I make of this? <laughs> I have a quick question for you. How do you deal with a delusional person with a client? I mean, that's got to be a little more difficult because... It this, happens all the time. The stakes all the time. You mean like okay. a John Hinckley or something like that? Well, just somebody who... It, Good example. That's something like, like for example, there is... Have you ever heard of erotomania? Yes. I haven't, but maybe. Erotomania is a fantasized... It's it's a, a person... It, it occurs when a person fantasizes a relationship that is not there. Oh, sure. It happens a lot Intense to celebrities. emotional yeah. relationship yeah. that is not there. Yep. Like Hinckley. You mentioned Hinckley. Yep. Hinckley... Uh, fantasized that he had a relationship, close, you know, an intimate relationship with Jodie Foster, mm -hmm. and he wanted to impress her. Right. So she had no connection with this guy at all. He had never met her. He'd never seen her in person. But he confabulated this, this, you know, the two of them against the world kind of thing. And um, 
that is a mental, erotomania is a form of mental illness. It's an obsessive, part on the obsessive continuum. And basically what you do is you get the mental health uh, community involved, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the law enforcement community involved, depending on the what what has been done, what's the offense. Mm -hmm. If you shoot the president, you're gonna deal with law enforcement right. first. Of course. And then you're gonna go, then you're going to St. Elizabeth's <laughs> Hospital and forever mm -hmm. after, which is what happened. You know, as, <laughs> as like a, a victim, let's say dealing with um, a delusional person, wouldn't you have to prepare for worst case scenario only because mm -hmm. you are dealing with somebody who is delusional. You don't know their point of view per se. You don't know what their stakes are in the situation. Well, you know, there's a demonization of mental of mental disorders. There's a demonization of the mentally ill, which where people have the idea, and I only say this because this is along the lines of what you're saying, that someone who's schizophrenic or delusional uh, in some way is somehow dangerous. Right. It's not necessarily the case at all. In the great majority of cases, it's not so. Um, there's always uh, weapon history there's always a, but there are you know you have to look at everything yeah. but yes there are irrational acts that happen out of the blue uh, seemingly it's just that when you look back you see a series of sure. indicators when this person is getting more and more agitated right. more and more fixated on someone who they might believe is you know threatening them mm -hmm. uh, there's always a paranoid you know overlay to this yeah. so having having um, someone analyze the threat uh, is a very specialized thing to do and it's not something everybody can really do on a general basis everybody really on a general basis should live their lives and have a have have confidence that these incidents are rare but when you go out in public you know just be aware of your environment uh, not overly paranoid but just aware when you go into a crowd that you're not presenting uh, someone who is walking around with uh, an open purse or, or uh, you know, some sort of, of target uh, rich environment for people who are going to commit or someone in their life who is becomes a problem for for them uh, and don't minimize that you know be able to talk to people about what's going on with your concerns about what your daily activities are. We have about three minutes left. Uh, I do have a, a fastball question coming up in a little bit, so hang tight for that, Dr. Puckett. Uh, but the last couple of minutes, I wanted to, to ask you, um, how would you give tips to people? Uh, you just gave one right now to be more vigilant, to look around. But how would you give them a tip to approach law enforcement mm. if they believe they're being stalked, if they believe they're being uh, um, uh, there's an assessment of threat there? or not threat assessment, I can't even say, but they're being stalked. Um, how would you approach the law enforcement individual to tell them that? Is there a certain way? And uh, then we'll get to your fastball question. There's just so many questions, we just don't have enough time. But I think probably uh, with law enforcement, people assume that they're, you're gonna be laughed at, and it depends. There are people who take things more or less seriously. Uh, most peace officers are trained, I mean, essentially they're there to, you know, maintain the peace and protect and serve. There are a lot of very, very good policemen out there. If you have an issue though, the best thing is to go to the police station or the sheriff's office and ask to speak to someone about uh, a matter that concerns you. It's, it's, you're not sure whether it presents a, a threat or not, but you're very worried. Be very rational and direct about it. Don't uh, don't think that they're go not going to take you seriously. Just you know, trust in the process and say, I don't know what this really means, but I need help in in evaluating this. Can you help me? Uh, I feel that this is a danger for me. Excellent um, advice. They are here to protect the public. Yeah. Excellent advice. All right, you ready for your fastball question, Doctor Puckett? Fastball. All right. So you have all these wonderful skills. And we're so grateful that you have them. We're so thankful. Do you ever sit back one night and wonder, maybe I'm going to try to solve Jack the Ripper. I'm going to try to solve Zodiac Killer. <laughs> if there is, is there any case you were particularly interested in trying to solve? Well, as you know, um, one of the, the biggest case in my career was the Unabomb case. Uh, and uh, that was, I was immensely privileged to be part of the team that finally brought him uh, to justice because he was a needle in a haystack. Mm -hmm. He was a one in a million. They should have a separate category in the 
uh, for him in this in the uh, uh, the manual of diagnostic the DSM diagnostic of statistical manual of mental disorders he is unique uh, so I feel that I dealt with I had the opportunity to deal with uh, his mind and uh, it was as complicated if not more complicated than any spy that I worked on wow. when I was in the FBI um, I think that probably now it's funny that you say that about uh, Jack the Ripper because uh, there have been profilers on television doing stories about, uh, you know, looking over the evidence. I know John yeah. Douglas was on one oh. where he was, look, look at the evidence again and look. Uh, all those things are always fun to do. They're always fun to do, the historical cases. Um, but uh, I think I think it would, I, there isn't one case right now off the top of my head that I can think I'd give my eye teeth to know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would give my eye teeth to work on just about anything that's complicated. Like that's that. my what I still why I still do what I, I do. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Puckett. Yeah, thank you. For my being pleasure. on the show. We can't wait for part two. You don't want to miss part two. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you, Dr. Puckett. This is amazing information and we're lucky to have people or professionals like you. <laughs> that's right. Fantastic co-host, fantastic guest, fantastic show. Remember, our motto is simple, everyone. Wherever there's psychology involved, even in the mind of a psychopath or a stalker, we're there. We'll see you next time, everyone. Hi, welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time, we don't even know what's wrong with us, and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. We're here with former NIPTUC star Kelly Carlson. She also works with closely the Center for Security Policy. Welcome to the Circle, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, and today we have Dr. Kathleen Puckett. She has spent 23 years as an FBI special agent. She's currently a behavior analyst and co-founder of TK Associates LLC in San Francisco. Let's welcome to the Circle, Dr. Puckett. Hello. Hi, Dr. Nice Puckett. Welcome back. Well, we're going to talk about your books, uh, Hunting the American Terrorists, which is right here, Homeland Insecurity, which is right here. These two great books. So we're going to explore the terrorist. And I'm assuming there's only one kind of terrorist. <laughs> Gee, that would be nice. Um, no, there are as many kinds of terrorists as there are kinds of people. Um, wow. You know, the in let me just say something at the outset that most people don't think about. Um, terrorism is a social phenomenon, meaning that, you know, when we started working uh, terrorists in the FBI, uh, it, it's been it's been, it's been a long haul. The terrorism, counterterrorism division was only actually instigated, instituted in 1999. Before that, it was under the National Security Division of the FBI. And my partner, my business partner and co-author, Terry Churchy, was the first deputy assistant director for counterterrorism uh, of the FBI. Basically, uh, when we, the first book, Hunting the American Terrorist, that you referred to, was the story of how we uh, finally caught the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. Very, very complicated case that took nearly 18 years to resolve. And it's, it's the, the story of how we did it uh, has a lot to do with uh, the different way that Terry approached the problem. He brought people from the counterintelligence side of the FBI like myself uh, who were used to catching spies or, or chasing spies. Uh, and he essentially uh, brought in uh, elements of both sides of the FBI to work the problem of the, mm -hmm. of the Unabomber case. So we didn't stop with the evidence. We, we looked, we, we wanted to do behavioral analysis of the whole, the whole aspect. I was with the 
the team for two and a half years and up until we arrest, you know, and then arrested him in 1996 at his cabin in Montana. Um, no one in the FBI, but about five of us thought that in the world actually thought that, that Theodore Kaczynski was the Unabomber. Even people who were going up to, to arrest him didn't think it was him. He was living in a cabin with no power, no running water uh, for 25 years. And he perpetrated all these acts of terrorism, mm -hmm. uh, was trying to take a plane down, we're pretty sure, at the very end there with his last bomb. The interesting thing about it was, after it was all over, Terry said, he was at the Counterterrorism Division, and Terry and Louis Free, who was the director of the FBI at the time, said, what can we find, what can we learn from this case, this Unabomb case, and what about all these other lone wolf guys, like the, Timothy McVeigh, and at the time we were hunting Eric Robert Rudolph. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these lone offenders that seem to come out of nowhere, they're not part of a group. What's going on here? What are we, how are we going to see them coming? I started studying this, and this comprises the last part of the book, Hunting the American Terrorist. And I worked with psychologists uh, and psychiatrists all over the country who had worked these cases, um, as well as uh, Department of Corrections with S Secret Service. Uh, it was interesting because Secret Service specializes in seeing threats come out of nowhere. Sure. They are out there looking for threats from nowhere because they don't have, they have a lot of intelligence information, but they are very quick to recognize signals. Now, everybody can't be a Secret Service agent and, you know, be trained to this degree. But I wanted to find out how people could di differentiate who these lone terrorists are mm -hmm. from you know, everybody else walking down the street. Here's the, here's the critical difference that I found out. Terrorists, terrorist groups are social groups. Most people belong to these groups for social reasons, not because they're ever going to do anything violent. They may talk a big game. They may want to, to, to talk like they would really like to destroy, blow things up, kill people. But really what they're there for is because they're pissed off about something, they're, they're unsuccessful in life, they're, they're just have, but what they want to do is they want to commune with people who share their views, their radical views. And once they do, they feel better. That's what they're there for. They socially connect to other people in the group. Except so social groups, human need, huh? terrorist groups, are social groups. Sure. And most people in them will never do anything violent. But what happens to the person who has the same feelings, is angry, is very radical in their views, uh, but has a history of unsuccessful attempts at making connections with other people. They try to make connections with other people and they can't. None of these guys could. Theodore Kaczynski wrote about thousands of pages about it, how he couldn't, he had trouble making friends and he was a social cripple. He called himself a social cripple. Timothy McVeigh talked about himself as, as being alone, even though he tried up until the day that he drove the, the van full of explosives up to uh, Oklahoma City, uh, was posting notices, I need fighters to join me. He couldn't, they, he was thrown out of a Michigan militia meeting for being too violent. He and Terry, and, and yeah, and Terry Nichols mm -hmm. together because they were not able to be that normal social group. They were always too violent, too extreme. Their inner psychology made it impossible for them to make the inner connections that most people are able to make. So what do they connect to? Because they're human beings and they're wired to connect. We're mm -hmm. all wired the same way. We're all wired. There are deficits in wiring, but we're all you know, defects in wiring, but we're all wired to connect. We're social beings. If you're a social being and your wiring is bad and you can't connect, you still need to connect with something. So what they do and what I found was that they connect to the ideology. The, the ideology will never fail them. It will never call them names. It will never... Uh, be there, uh, it will never disappoint them. They can become the true believers of the ideology. And because the ideology is so frames their thoughts and gives them a reason to live, they have their at the reason their actions are so big and societally and, and societal level violence, federal buildings, mm -hmm. the guy Anders Breivik in Norway who mm -hmm. shot all those kids on that island at the time he right after he bombed the parliament in Oslo, 
uh, huge acts, not, not targeting specific individuals because it's society that they can't connect to. So here's the thing that, that people who, uh, the key to understanding and doing something about this is the community, is people themselves. It's just like in New York, uh, you know, the see, if you see something, say something. That has, that has caused all, that has been responsible for an awful lot of prevention of violence and terrorist activity, uh, that attitude. And the more people, people uh, respond in that way, if you see something that bothers you, say something about it. That's what you mentioned um, in the last show. Yeah, I think that's yeah. important. And I think people need to know that that's welcomed by law enforcement because people Very are intimidated. So. Very much so, yeah. No, p people are, the community is the key because the people that we're talking about grew up in the community. They may, most people know that this kid had trouble socializing and got fixated on guns or hated, you know, or, or was doing all kinds of problems. You know, there was something developing there. Most mm -hmm. people know when they look back, the, the guy that killed all those, uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, um, uh, killed all the kids on the 4th of July, uh, was, was shooting black people on the street. He was a racist, uh, you know, white supremacist and uh, couldn't, couldn't make it in any group, couldn't make it in any relationship, but was absolutely convinced that his mission was to kill interracial couples and, and black people and people of uh, uh, non-white minorities, you know, mm -hmm. just really specifically, because they were the ones that were, in his mind, ruining not only his life, but the life of everyone, and he was going to crusade and, and mm -hmm. make it better. Let me ask you this, Dr. Puckett. Did you see any upbringing commonalities among these? Yeah, it's funny because I looked at all of these. I had about 10 people in my study. There were no, some of them came from single parent households. Some of them came from uh, intact households. Some of them had multiple siblings. Some of them were only children. Some of them were in their 20s. Some of them were, you know, Kaczynski was in his 40s. So uh, when he started his activities. So that wasn't their commonality. It wasn't the way they were raised. It wasn't the way they were uh, educated and it wasn't the way, but it, but it was their internal social deficit, mm -hmm. inability to make the connections they desperately wanted to make that fueled that fire. And let me tell you that this is extremely hard to be this kind of person. It isn't something that anybody would voluntarily want to do. You're isolated. You have no, no support. You have no one. The only thing you have is your ideology. People aren't wired that way. It's a very unsatisfying way to live. Most people don't know that Theodore Kaczynski wrote very painfully mm -hmm. in his journal about how he wanted to get married and have kids and lead a normal life. Mm -hmm. And he paid for a session of psychotherapy to try to find out how to do that during the period that he wasn't bombing. Mm -hmm. Do you know, do you, uh, most of the people are still alive, so I guess you can't, Tell, but have you seen any studies out there that talk about any kind of organic changes in their brain? Do they have a uh, reduced prefrontal cortex, anything like that? That's really, um, I think that's 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 really being um, studied. That's that that is something that, you know, the nature versus nurture, and also the the apparatus versus the process. It's it's. Um, we're not really sure. We're still not sure what schizophrenia is in the brain. So they're mm -hmm. still studying, you know, aspects mm -hmm. of that. So that kind of complex behavior as far as what wiring in the brain relates to it all everybody's studying that so let's talk a little bit about this um we talked a little about this off the show there's a word being thrown around out there called the lone wolf pack which seems almost contradictory just by the name itself what is that what are they trying well, to I convey think I think it, it shows the confusion mm -hmm. that people have about how to categorize right. you know lone wolves are rare and people don't understand them because they're very unique. They're not that way by choice. They're born that way. That's that's how they socialize. That's they don't have the ability. It's like a psychopath is born without the ability to empathize. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it, my friend of mine, uh, Mary Ellen O'Toole, who was profilers uh, in uh, at the profiling unit at Quantico, always mm -hmm. used to say, "If uh, you can, uh, you know, you can bake a cake." 
if you forget something, it's cake is baked. You can't really put it in there after that. Right. And so that's what happens is with psychopaths is there um, something in the wiring we don't understand what right. went went wrong at some process, some complex convolution of processes, but there's no empathy. And if there's no empathy, then there's no reason to care about anybody else except yourself. So it's narcissism multiplied by mm -hmm. malevolence. You know, so she she uh, really has worked, done a lot of work on psychopaths, and uh, she works with Robert Hare, who mm -hmm. wrote, uh, you know, the, uh, the and tests. came from Robert Cleckley's work, and also he, you know, the Mask of Sanity, and you know, who are these people who, right. who do these things? I know a lot of the people who are working in the field on psychopathy, um, but as far as lone wolf packs, uh, getting back to your question, Carlos, the the um, People want to know, people want to be able to put things into categories because that's how we think. It's like, well, what is this guy? Uh, he's not a member of a group really, but he's, um, he's acting like a member of a group. He's quoting this group. Uh, maybe these lone wolves are banding together. They can't, people think in terms of social right. uh, norms and lone wolf pack is a nonsensical concept because there's no way mm -hmm. that there that anybody who can't be part of a group will be in a pack with other people who can't be part of a group. Right. Yeah, it's it doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. No. Which I've learned right. never to apply logic to these right. kind of situations. Or You're, to human behavior. <laughs> yeah, you will not yeah. go anywhere, right? right. Well, I think Kelly is a behavior analyst in the making here. Yeah, I'm Absolutely. learning. Um, yeah. <laughs> So let's go to the most current event right now. We know France had that ter terrible tragedy. They had four, well, it seems three or four. I'm not even going to try to figure it out because I don't think the news has even figured it out yet. But they had all those terrorists. It was interesting because when I asked you earlier about the upbringing commonalities, these, these people actually did have some kind of commonality. It seemed like from the brief information that I received, um, they were all... Uh, uh, two of the brothers were orphans, if I remember correctly. All three or four of them came from foster care homes. Not to say that everybody that goes through there is going to become this, but they have these commonalities. They're, they're kind of um, salient, I guess, for me. Uh, what do you think about them? What's your insight on this issue? Well, what I thought about when I first uh, saw the pictures of the two brothers before, while they were still at large, uh, before they were uh, killed at the, at the resolution of that hostage situation, was the Sarnaya brothers at the Boston bombing. Because there were two individuals who had um, very fixed ideas um, that were fueled by a misunderstanding of the applications of a religion, mm -hmm. which is what the radicalization of Islam is really about. Uh, there's no prescription in Islam really to uh, kill your neighbor or, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the kind of, uh, uh, you know, beheading people kind of, of uh, situation that, that people seem to think of, of uh, Muslims as, they're, Muslims are horrified by this. But Tsarnaevs had the same allegiance to that violent aspect of um, uh, jihad that the brothers in France did, and people who were essentially not part of the of the uh, society at large. I mean, there is a big population of unassimilated That's right. uh, people in France who uh, hmm. are not part of the of the uh, the general. And that surprises the French because they're but they're very the French are very, you know, liberty oriented, but they're very it surprises the French because why it's it's how how has this happened in our country? Uh, it, that's what happens in every country. There, if there are mm -hmm. unassimilated, um, un, uh, very uh, angry elements, eventually someone who is more concerned about wreaking havoc than suffering themselves is going to come to the fore. And that's happened here too, like at the Boston bombing. I have a question for you. Um, when the Boston bombings happened, I was at um, Little Creek Naval Base, and the person I was with was a Pakistani a analysis for the agency. And we were watching the news, and so I said, well, you know, what do you think this is? And he goes, absolutely, this is a child of an immigrant, mm -hmm. because 
the children of the, the immigrant that comes here does not, it doesn't have a, or this person doesn't feel like it has a home. It's not America, because they don't quite mm -hmm. fit in, and they're not necessarily part of the, the other country that their parents came from, and so the assimilation process is more difficult for them, and sure enough, it ended up kind of being the case. I'm not that's saying right. that's always applicable, but do you find that to be common? Yeah, it's it's uh, although I don't want to demonize you know first first of generation course. people, but but basically um, if there is a social problem and they feel that they suffer from it, they're going to you know there are people who will take up arms in defense of uh, uh, some opponent that they fantasize that is keeping that is assaulting their parents or their origin or their identity or their national origin. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not um, it's understandable that they would be angry. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people would be angry. they they have a lot of unrest in Europe sure. with all kinds of minority populations that they have not uh, successfully assimilated into their cultures because that's just not how they evolved. The Europe Europe uh, although well Europe has has uh, collided with it with itself over and over again. You know the Roman Empire, and uh, right. you know oh, yeah. essentially found that out when they decided to incorporate, uh, you know, Northern Europe and and Britain into and uh, the Middle East into their uh, their empire. There are problems when you do that. People aren't really willing to sure. submit. Right. We're down to our last couple of minutes. I know you have to run. You got to get back to work to take heat. TK Associates LLC in San Francisco. There's some shameless plugging for you. Um, what do you? What would you recommend for people? How would you help people prepare themselves, or or uh, help us in America to be able to be better prepared for these kind of terrorist attacks here? What should we be doing? I think it's exactly what um, we were talking about off camera uh, before. I think that the New York model of see, if you see something, say something, is the most important thing for citizens to know. What you observe is is more unique than uh, anyone else does. If, if more people trusted their own instincts and said, you know, that doesn't look right to me, I'm going to say something, but I'm, I'm not going to just say it to anybody. I'm going to go ahead and report it to, to the law enforcement. Uh, because people assume that law enforcement is going to not write them off because they are seeing to this issue on their own. They have a limited number, as you said earlier, of eyes and ears. Right. And uh, for instance, there, are, there aren't that many FBI agents in the world, but there are a lot of people who FBI agents talk to mm -hmm. who are in the world that multiply. That's a force multiplier, and, and that's what you want. And the, the citizens or the people, they know the baseline of the area. They I know mean, what's normal. They so, know what's normal, and they know what point. isn't. Right. Is it me or just we just don't have enough time? With it. No, we're not even close. I need like a year with you. Like, Dr. Puckett, you're not going anywhere until nope. 8 o'clock tonight, so exactly. hang tight. <laughs> Once again, two great books, Hunting the American Terrorist, Homeland mm -hmm. Insecurity. Dr. Puckett, where do we get a hold of you if people want to know more about you or use your services? Well, uh, we are on the Internet, tkassociatesllc.com, and uh, where our, you can see our books there. You can also see what we do. Uh, and uh, we don't put a lot of casework on there, uh, but we do have a media page, and we, we update it not as often as we should, but we will. Well, I'll update it with this. Nice. Kelly, thank cool. you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you, Dr. Back Puckett. Thank you, everyone. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, we are there. See you next time, everyone.